Welcome to Future Ready Live. I'm your host, Tom Hood, where we talk about topics that will help PPAs, CJMAs, finance and accounting pros prepare for change and transformation. Today, we're going to be talking about disrupting disruption and the future of finance. So with me is Pascal Finette, co-founder and chief heretic at B Radical. He was Singularity U's Chair for Entrepreneurship and Open Innovation, a former Google, Mozilla, eBay, also an executive coach, relentlessly focusing on amplifying positive change and the impact of other change makers. Pas Pascal has been working with AICPA and CPA.com since 2019 on a special program called Navigating the Future to help CPAs and CGMAs be even more future ready. He will be live at Digital CPA in Nashville on December 7th and keynoting our first annual Future Finance meeting on December 8th through the 10th. Pascal, say hello. I am so stoked to be here, Tom. This is going to be a super fun conversation. I know it. Yes. Well, yeah. And Pascal, I've worked on a, a few things together over the years with uh, Digital CPA, et cetera. And uh, I'm, I'm equally pumped about this. So let's start with I've been intrigued by your idea of disrupting disruption and know you've been doing research and talk. So what, what do you really mean by that idea? Well, this, the starting point, Tom, for me is that uh, I, I, I think and, and probably a lot of the viewers and listeners that right now probably will agree that this whole term disruption is so overused. Nobody can actually even define it anymore. It's just being thrown around. Um, Consultants, of course, love it because it's the way you get money from your, your clients. Um, we liken this whole idea around disruption to um, tofu. If you're a vegetarian, you've ever eaten tofu, you know this like soy-based substrate. Uh, and I'm a vegetarian. I eat a lot of tofu. You know, tofu tastes like absolutely nothing. And then you put sauce on it and it tastes like the sauce. And disruption has become tofu. It doesn't mean anything anymore. So... <laughs> The, the way we started this was basically saying, like, listen, like this whole thing is like, let's understand disruption, first of all, from a first principles basis. What is it? What actually leads to disruption? What does disruption actually look like today? Um, and then really look into and this is based on a an interview I've done with a dear friend of ours, Andy Billings, who's the head of creative profitability at the Game Maker Electronic Arts publicly traded company. And he said once in an interview with me, he said, Pascal, when you talk to the people on the front lines, they all tell you that disruption has nothing to do with what they write about in the books. So we got really curious about this and essentially talked to practitioners. We talked to you know dozens and dozens and dozens of people who are doing the work and um, extracted a whole bunch of like insights out of that. And I'm sure we'll dig deeper, deeper into this in our conversation today. But that's where we started with disrupting disruption. Got it. I love that. I love that idea. And and then I guess this gets to this next idea, which I know I've heard you talk a lot about, is this whole pace of change, the whole exponential uh, mindset that you've got to have today that's much different than from what we experienced before. So how do you see that? And and what has, if any, has the pandemic had any uh, impact on that notion of speed of change and, and such? Well, I think, Tom, the first thing with the pandemic really brought home, I think, for, for many of us is, you know, even a couple of years ago, I still, you know, stood on stage and Tom, you saw me do this and talk about the nature of exponential change and the fact that we as humans are really not really well equipped to understand exponentials, um, that we tend to think in linear terms. Yeah. And uh, clearly living through a pandemic, the, the tragedy that it is, Pandemics spread exponentially. We've learned this, unfortunately, the hard way, I think. Um, so I don't need to explain to people anymore what exponential per se means. Um, I also think that clearly, even if you compare this to, let's say, three, four, five years ago, people do understand that technology moves on these really rapid accelerating paces. Um, think about, you know, in the profession, um, think about the use of automation, um, use of process automation systems, artificial intelligence, the whole conversation around blockchain. Think about uh, crypto assets and like the craziness about NFTs at the moment. All of this seems to really explode and it explodes because it moves on an exponential curve. And if anything, and I'm clearly not the first person to have said this, if anything, uh, COVID has accelerated a lot of these moves, right? 
Um, a very good example for me is, um, Tom, you kindly uh, mentioned that we started working with the AICPA in 2019, and you and I brought a tool to the profession um, called the Disruption Map, where you look at the implications of the implication. It's kind of like this interesting idea of where you look at the outer edges of what happens when something happens and what happens because of that. Yeah. And then the number one topic, and you might remember this, at DCPA was, uh, this was 2019, yes, yeah. 2019, was remote work. Everybody was like saying, oh man, remote work, it might come, it might come in five or 10 years, we will see what happens, right? And clearly, I mean, you know, we moved through a pandemic where everybody suddenly became a remote worker. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that the pandemic has accelerated without a doubt a lot of these uh, moves and changes. I also think in some other areas, it has probably stopped them. Um, so I do think that uh, if you think about the leverage or the use of blockchain in the accounting profession, that was a sh really huge and super hot topic in 2019. And it seemed to have come a little bit to a halt in 2020 because we were all so busy with you know, all the work we have to do. Like just think about like all the craziness about PPP, for example. Yeah, exactly. So, so then, you know, you're right. You're so right about blockchain. In my opinion, it was like overhyped. There wasn't enough use cases in our profession. Meanwhile, it was moving in a lot of other areas, right? Which we don't always see, which is another, I think, challenge that our profession might have from that standpoint. But let's, so let's, let's relate it a little bit to finance and accounting because um, we're, we're experiencing waves of disruption or change, however we want to talk about it. I, I talked to one global finance group who's in the midst of their um, major transformation and their people said, it feels like we're like bobbing in the ocean, just waiting for another wave of change to come washing over us. Is that something, so how do you deal with that? I guess is what, what the question everyone's starting to ask and I'm sure we'll be diving into that in Nashville more, but what's, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, definitely plus one on, on the diving in in Nashville, without a doubt. But um, I, I, hey, without a doubt, I do think that many of us, if not all of us, I personally clearly feel like what you just described, this this like being lost in the ocean, bobbing, waiting for the waves to like crush on your tiny little boat. Now, at the same time, I also do think that, and this is what we've seen in the work we've done on disruption, where, you know, again, as a, as a quick reminder, we interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of, of global leaders in this field that if you zoom out a little bit, you actually can see patterns. You can see these big trends emerging. And if you take a little bit of a longer term perspective on these things, you actually see pathways. It becomes much clearer. So yes, while you're in your little boat, it might feel like, you know, like the ocean is crushing around you. But when you zoom out and you see the satellite image, you see that it's it might be just a tiny little, you know, like a local um, a local storm brewing over you and there's bigger there's bigger movements you can see. And just to give you one example for this, um, think about um, when you like take the zoomed out perspective, um, think about uh, crypto. Like you think about crypto assets. I mean, that's a huge topic at the moment. You might have followed the NFT, the non-fungible token craziness where people suddenly buy uh, digital penguins. Um, for like tens of thousands of dollars, which uh, appreciate in value by like 100x over a weekend because someone tweets something. I mean, all of this is like, make, make no mistake. I, I think that all of that is craziness and it's the tulip mania from like the 1600s uh, or 1700s, right? Now, when you zoom out though, and you start thinking about what happens here actually, what is the, the underlying dynamic, the idea that I can take an asset which I couldn't prove provenance for, for example, beforehand, and now I put I can do that. I uh, create liquidity in markets where there wasn't liquidity or a lot of liquidity beforehand. You see these big trends happening. And then you can ask yourself, how do I prepare myself? How do I position myself strategically? And I think it comes back to third, like literally first principles thinking. Yeah. Um, so the old way of like really thinking about what do we know to be true and then level up from there, argue up from there. Got it. So that, that means we're going to be challenged as the finance and accounting profession, right? To begin to adopt more of that exponential mindset, to be able to zoom out and think about those trends and then say, so what does it mean to us? Yeah, and I think you live in this interesting um, polarity, right? These, um, this world where you have these 
seemingly competing yet at the same time desirable goals and you need to manage both of them and another one of the tools we brought to the the profession um early this year um been around for quite a while called uh, this idea around polarity management how do you actually manage these things i give you a simple example for this tension short and long term right or reopening of the economy versus keeping your covid infection rates down like they're both desirable Right. But they seem to be at odds with each other. And I think the important piece about the, the, the idea around polarity management, of course, there's much more to it, but is that there is no single deterministic solution to it. It's about managing the tension. And I think leaders, all of us are leaders in this world, um, leaders in this world need to be comfortable manage, managing the tension, having a foot in both sides, in both camps. Yeah. Yeah, that's that I, that makes a lot of sense. And and I do love your polarity mapping exercise that you're so it, it's going to be fun at Digital CPA this again this year to say now. All right. So now in your experience, you've been working with CPAs and, and the finance side now for a few years. Mm -hmm. What are you noticing? Like what what are you seeing about how CPAs are are picking this stuff up and how are they dealing with this fast future? So. Again, like I'm not telling you anything new here. It's just m more of a, you know, a bit of an outside in perspective, probably. Mm -hmm. I see um, in the profession, I see there's firms, there's leaders, there's organizations who are pounding on this. You know, basically, I, I mean, I've talked to leaders of, you know, small, medium sized, even large scale firms who say, oh, my God, this is this is the most amazing thing. Right, because they embrace the they embrace the chaos, <laughs> they embrace the change, and they say, "Listen, like this is this is a seismic shift in our industry because we're really moving away from a lot of the rote task of doing the accounting work per se, moving much more into a much more creative, uh, collaborative environment with my client, and even my CPA firm, like the the firm, you know, we are tiny. We work with a small CPA firm." Um, out of Nebraska, and even they have changed dramatically, you know, where in the old world, they did our books. In the new world, they keep calling me like, you know, weekly and say, hey, Pascal, we found this idea, we've got this idea, you should think about this. And I think there's a massive, a seismic change where I believe that the, the best firms, the good firms, they actually start to level up to this and yeah. start, to, um, start to use automation, start to use tools to do a much a bigger part of their what they consider their old world and of course i mean this puts a lot of interesting stress and strain on the on the profession per se um i know that there's a big debate currently about you know rejigging the exam and the content yeah. we teach um you know future cpas yeah. um because all of that has to change and it has to change pretty quickly and you know that is of course a challenge because as humans, I mean, face it, like, and I'm no different here. We actually don't like change all that much. You know, it's kind of nice if everything just keeps going the way it was, but that's not the world we're living in, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately. But you're right. You're you you definitely have your pulse on it, and I think I love the idea of us like leveling up because I think we are seeing that happen in in all walks of of this, and we have to take care of that next generation, which is a big part of what we're doing now with the new new CPA exam and and uh, even what we're doing in the in the management accounting area with CGMA. So those are definitely there. All right, so now I'm going to ask you to do what futurists do, look around the corner a little bit and just say, what should we be really paying attention to? Which I guess I'm hearing the zoom out idea. That's That mm -hmm. seems to be a big one. Um, polarity, being able to live in, in very uh, competing uh, priorities, if you will, paradox, I guess. But yeah, give me some of what, what do you see coming around the bend here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, let me just uh, clarify one thing. And uh, you heard me say this before, uh, even if, I, you know, I'm whatever classified as a futurist, whatever that means, by the way, um, <laughs> I'm not a person who's got a crystal ball. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, every futurist who tells you they know what the future will look like, they're basically like BSing you. It just doesn't work. Right. Because the future is like, it's so it's up to us to create the future. Now, clearly, you can see trends, you can see the big movements. I think uh, so instead of telling you, you know, like, oh, look out for crypto or NFTs or whatever, um, let me just give you um, three interesting insights we had um, distilled out of the uh, conversations we ha have around disruption with leaders in these organizations, because I think they are universally applicable and um, hopefully interesting for your audience. So two of them 
are not overly surprising. One surprised me personally a little bit. So here's the num the the three main things we hear from leaders who are successful in this whole innovation disruption field, regardless of industry. Number one is they all tell us you have to start. You have to start from first principles, and very often they um, cite. Um, the late Clayton Christensen's theory on the job to be done. So this idea that you need to figure out what your customer actually wants from you, what they want to be done. And then you need to ask yourself the question, how do I fulfill that need in the best possible way? Yeah. And it goes back to this, you know, the old adage, people don't buy drills, they buy holes yeah. um, or like ways to hang a picture, uh, which, by the way, I spoke to... Um, uh, Black and Decker, and they tell me very much that people still buy drills because they like the fact that they want to have a drill. But that is a, that is an aside. But really, people, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, I think there's truth to it. Like people, yeah. you know, like people want to have a problem fixed. And I think particularly in the CPA profession, if you think about like the first principles is I don't want to have an accountant. I, you know, the, the job to be done for me isn't like do my books. The job to be done is for me to like help me run my finances, make sure that wow. I'm compliant and so on and so on. And then you, the question becomes, how do I best fulfill this? So this is number one. Yep. Number two is, um, and this is particular truth for the leaders, that if you embark on an innovation and disruption journey, it really comes down to leadership. You really need to be committed to do these things and also be comfortable that very often by very definition, you will enter into fields where you just don't have the answers yep. and you need to be okay with that. And, you know, many companies aren't. And I've got a beautiful short story about this, which is, um, and this comes from a dear friend of mine, Maurice Conte, who used to run Telefonica Alpha, which is a, a research think tank. Um, he likened this to having a pet tiger. You know, it's like people like to have a pet tiger. People want to have innovation and disruption because it's cool. And, you know, pet tiger is cool. Like, you know, like your neighbors come and you're like the, the cool kid on the block, et cetera. Now, when you have a pet tiger, you realize, oh, my God, they're like an absolute pain to like maintain. They eat a lot of food. They need a lot of like space. It's really hard to get a vet even to come out. And every once in a while, they eat your children. Right. So, <laughs> you know, and in reality, you probably don't want to have a pet tiger. And you need to be you need to be really committed to saying, you know what, if I if I go down this path of innovation and disruption, I need to be committed to it. Yeah. And then the third one is and this is the one which surprised me is we hear this over and over and over again, is an unwilling and unwavering commitment um, towards um, reskilling your people. And reskilling your people, not as in, oh yeah, we get a, you know, whatever, a LinkedIn um, learning subscription, which by make no mistake is a great thing, but really identifying what are the gaps we're seeing in terms of their education in terms of their skill sets etc and then really investing into those so the best companies i find um, are actually very very serious about this idea so those are three i think future forward looking like you know traits um we can see in companies over and over again love it i i knew you were going to be brilliant so you i just i had to, i was taking notes while you were talking so it was so good um Anyhow, th thank you so much, Pascal, for doing this. This was awesome. Uh, tons of takeaways. We are going to blog about this, and then we'll be having you out there in uh, December in Nashville. Like you said, that's going to be fun. So for all of you out there, for more with Pascal, he's he's going to be at Digital CPA Conference in Nashville in December, along with our Future of Finance group. You can follow him on Twitter at P Finette, F-I-N-E-T-T-E. Visit him online at www.finette.com. -E Thank you for joining me. And don't miss our other Future Ready live sessions on the first and third Tuesday of each month, noon Eastern. So with that, Pascal, thank you very much. Tom, pleasure to be here. It was awesome.